Yeah, so Metro City Council is picking a fight with Occupy Louisville since they're passing these fucking laws. It's kind of like they uh, they said they, there's a loophole that they couldn't figure out. That's because we actually have fucking freedom. We got more freedom in Kentucky than what we have in America because our Constitution uh, gives us more freedoms. Read your Constitution. Section 4 says we're allowed to revolt. We're allowed to have a revolution. So, Mayor Fisher, that the public squares are ours. The public space is ours. We're allowed to camp. Those are our camping spots. Those are our grounds. You're wrong on this, and we should take this to court. Take it all the way to the Supreme Court. Fuck you. Yeah, we should definitely push this as far as we could push it because you're wrong on this. Um, there's a woman that was in Gallatin County that stayed in the office, and there was a fight. Well, who's, uh, whose office is it? Is it the people's or is it the politicians? And I think you have some justification to say that it's the citizens. And, uh, they can't stop you from doing your business. You know, you got to be able to keep on going. But if you're doing evil, maybe they should be stopping your business. Um, I don't know. So I don't think it's a, it's that clear cut, and I think there should be a decision. And to make precedent, to be able to take it to Supreme Court, Founders Square, they sold a dollar to Cordes Companies. So 4th Street Live, they own Founders Square for a dollar a fucking year. But we aren't allowed to, we're not allowed to spend a night at Founders Square. So whose pockets are um, Fisher in? Is it Insight and corporations, or is it the uh, people? Does he care about the labor unions, or does he care about the corporate lobbyist dollars? Which ones does he care about? So, uh, the idea that I wanted last year was I wanted the Gateway to make a sizable showing in Louisville. I mean, ideally he'd win, right? But if he was to get like 10% or more, just 10%, look what they did in uh, West Virginia. West Virginia, you had that guy who was in prison. <laughs> he was in prison, then he beat Obama. Or he had like 40% of the vote or some shit, and that make national headlines. Why does fucking West Virginia hate Obama so much? And that's when Obama was sent, or uh, Joe Biden, Obama sent Joe Biden to West Virginia to talk to those fucking racist hillbilly bastards. <laughs> and uh, Joe Biden's like working class, and so they're working class people, and they're trying to explain that they're working for them. And they need to actually, you know, here's what we need out of you. You need to understand what's going on, and you also need to... Uh, get on board with what we're doing. We need more people to help out and to speak out and to, you know, uh, speak out. I guess that's a good way to end that sentence. So speak out. Uh, so if we could get like 10% for Gatewood, so that applies with anybody else. We got Jill Stein on the ballot right now. Fuck Obama. Fuck Romney. Vote Jill Stein, Kentucky. Kentucky, vote for Jill Stein. Don't vote for Roseanne Barr. Don't vote for Cindy Sheehan. I like them. I like all their policies. They're too eccentric for me, okay? They're going to be good showmen, and they'll be good, um, you know, um, I like Cindy Sheehan. I like all of them, okay? I really like all of them. But Jill Stein beat Roseanne in the Green Party nominations, and so Roseanne's jumping on the Peace and Freedom Party and with Cindy Sheehan. So it's an interesting uh, pairing. Jill Stein has got the soccer mom look. She's got Noam Chomsky's endorsement. She's a Green Party. She just got arrested. She's standing up for what's right. So she's she's great. Jill Stein. Jill Stein 2012. Kentucky, vote for Jill fucking Stein. Vote for Green Party. Do something different for once in your life. Vote for Jill Stein. Jill Stein 2012. Jill Stein. So, um... Yeah. So if Jill Stein was to get a sizable portion in Kentucky, then that would show that uh, that there is a leftist movement, that there are a lot of liberals here who are dissatisfied for what what Obama is doing from the left, and so that balances it out. When you got extreme left, extreme right, then Obama will try to take the middle. But if there's no left, then he's just going to keep on going to the right. So by voting for Jill Stein, it stops the inevitable drift of Obama going towards the right. Since both Romney and uh, Obama, there's a rush to the middle. The Nixtonian strategy, right? He's got a fucking southern strategy, and then he's got the, the election strategy. On the primary, you talk to your base, and then for the general election, you run to the middle, and you talk to all middle America. And you say nothing at all, or hardly anything at all. And the southern strategy was to talk about busing, to attack busing, because that's a racist sentiment. There's reason why busing is connected with the black civil rights movement. It's how integration happened. Integration happened through busing. So when uh, Nixon is talking bad about busing, that's code for a um, anti black. And there's also. Uh, crack and welfare, whenever anybody talks about food stamps or crack or welfare, these are stereotypes that are being put on black people unfairly since more white people are on welfare. 
lots of white people are on meth, so that's white people have their own crack, their own lot of issues out of the white community. So um, it's bullshit when they characterize uh, Obama like that or anybody really like that. But Gingrich called Obama the food stamp president. He's a dick, man. Man, Gingrich is such a dick. So, uh, Louisville City Council elections and everybody, you could, uh, in order to look for liberals and look for the uh, Occupy people, the progressive candidates, and push their campaigns and champion the good ones and denounce the bad ones. We need to get into the political establishment, into the political game, and we need to get institutional change. And one of the ways to get institutional change is you get your representatives in there. You get your representatives in the office, get representatives that are good for the people. Secretary of State Elaine Walker predicted that 25% to 28% of Kentucky voters will go to the polls on November 8th, uh, which make it the lowest turnout for a general election since 1999. So that was, uh, okay, so the general election was 25%, and then the primary was 12%. So the general election was a little bit more, it's a quarter, so maybe 30 40% maybe will come out for this Obama election, since the Obama-Romney election will be the biggest election in Kentucky for quite some time, bigger than our fucking governor's race, and bigger than the primaries, and bigger than everything else, since, you know, we we have more control with local elections, so why would you come out for the big, you know, uh, presidential election where you have, your vote won't matter, vote for Obama, vote for Romney, you're fucking wasting your vote, go ahead, waste your vote, Kentucky, vote for Obama, he's not going to win... Uh, Kentucky, vote for Obama, he's a, or vote for Romney, he's already won Kentucky, they don't give a shit about your vote, they're not going to work that hard for it, they'll run one campaign or two campaign ads on TV, you will not see them, they'll run through here, but I'm telling you, listen to their words, ask them, if you get a hold of them, if you talk to them, what will you do for Kentucky, what will you do specifically for the bluegrass state, what will you do for us, and then you'll get your answer, what, do you, what will you do for Kentucky? And if they give you some bullshit answer about working for all the people, they'll say, fuck you. I want something specifically for us. We need, Kentuckians need more shit than anybody else, and we need to stand up for ourselves, and we need to speak up. A closed mouth, don't get fed. Kentuckians, stand up, speak up. You need to get fed. If you're hungry, you're not hungry for long. Eventually, you get fed. So, um, yeah, so once the political establishment sees that there's a strong liberal movement, 10% vote for Gatewood, 15% uh, vote for Jill Stein, anybody voting against any of these assholes in the city council now, which I need to check out, I need to see who, I need a power map, actually, of Louisville, who runs Louisville, I have no idea, I don't understand this place, uh, this city, um, it seems daunting, but it doesn't seem as daunting as I once thought it was, so, carrying on, um, the political establishment will morph once they see that there's a strong liberal movement. It'll, it'll take us seriously. And really the success of a third-party campaign is if you can get one of the major candidacies to adopt your platforms with the Jill Stein movement in Kentucky. If we have a Jill Stein Green Party movement, that will pull Obama closer to us. And will show Democrats that there is hope and that there is a growing underbelly of discontent amongst Democrats and there is time for change. So it'll show Democrats that it's time for change. And it is time for change. It's time for lots of change. Secretary of State predicted 25% would come out, lowest for the general election. So we're actually going down in our turnout numbers. Turnout 99 was 20%. So even back then, it was still dismal. Uh, one out of five people are voting. Uh, most Kentuckians choose not to participate in their democracy since turnout raised 25% in Kentucky. That means government isn't being held to the accountable to their people at all. So in the preface of Jack London's Iron Heel, which is a, uh, a, Zauer, a Howard Zinn recommended novel, so you had Ernest Everhard, right? Ernest Everhard out of Jack London's Iron Heel. Jack London is a, a I want to say White Fang or um, yeah, probably White Fang or Iron Will. I don't know some dog book. Jack London, Call of the Wild. Jack London wrote Call of the Wild and Iron Heel. So out of the Iron Heel, this is Ernest Everhard, the main character out of Iron Heel. You cannot escape us. It is true that you have read history, all right. It is true that labor has, from the beginning of history, been in the dirt. I agree with you. And I agree all that you have said. Power will be the arbiter. As it always has been the arbiter, it is a struggle of classes. Just as your class dragged down the old feudal nobility, 
so it shall be dragged down by my class, the working class. If you read your biology and if you read your sociology as closely as you do your history, you will see that this end I have described is inevitable. It does not matter whether it is in one, ten, or a thousand years. Your class will be dragged down, and it will be dragged down by power. We, the labor host, have conned that word over till our minds have all a tingle with it. Power. Power. That's how working class people will get out of the dumps that they're in. Get some power. Power is a kingly word. So there's another emerging truth which Jack London ignored. This is Howard Zinn talking. To which this generation is especially sensitive that the mode of revolution helps determine its future course. A revolution accomplished by the ballot box perpetuates the notion that real change can come about by manipulating papers and then by people struggling to change their personal lives, their immediate relationships, their communities. Their work, revolutions by force of arms, carry forward into the new society that ruthlessness, which London himself depicts and too readily accepts in the Iron Hill. Perhaps we have learned enough in the past half century to begin to think of a novel approach to the revolution. A new mode of revolution would go far beyond the ballot box. And this is key. This, is, this should be like Howard Zinn's principle, Howard Zinn's um, um, commandment, his, his tenth commandment, or his Howard Zinn's eleventh commandment. Howard Zinn's 11th commandment is the new revolution. A new mode of revolution would go beyond the ballot box. People everywhere would begin to live cooperatively, not in mass organizations which override individual feelings, but in small groups based on working together, resisting the state together. In such groups, new relationships of intimacy and cooperation born of common struggles could develop between black and white, male and female, old and young, all this in the midst of an inhuman society while fighting to change that society. People could work as cultural and political guerrillas, mobile, imaginative, so embedded in the lower structures of society and embedded with inside of its crevices in so many different places and so many different quarters as to be invulnerable to the crude mass power of the state so that if they are crushed in one place, these affinity groups would rise again in ten other places. Until there are so many changed minds, so many changed ways of living that the revolution would not be defeated because it would already be here. The old structures, despite their wealth and arms, would flail ineffectually at such a revolution and then begin to wither because their sustenance, the labor that operates them, the minds that accept them, had turned to other things. So without the minds, you can't have a you can't have the system cannot work. Without the obedient minds. If you're talking amongst other people and you're develop, developing your lives amongst other people, it begins to go into a direction um, that, that gives you more dignity and gives you more solidarity and gives you more unity and makes you feel welcome and belonging. Uh, you have a belonging. So, um, I, had a, I was thinking actually this is a, oh, I had a bunch of thoughts that I actually want to make Occupy Louisville a better um, organization and I know it's you know it's pretty vain of me to come with uh, criticisms first because I um, I know how to get signatures and I can you know uh, help for ballot access but when it comes to organizing small groups I'm um, I guess I need I don't know I'm not good at listening to other people and it's hard to just sit there when you disagree with so many things that are being said so Unless you're in a group where it's open and democratic and is consensus-based, it's hard to um, really trust anybody. So that's what I loved about Occupy, the uh, ideals of Occupy, at least, that coming out of uh, Wall Street. They did use stack. They used parliamentary stack in Occupy Louisville, but they weren't consensus-based. I voted against – they were going to cut discussion out. Discussion was part of the process, the rules of order, the agenda, and they were going to cut it out, and I voted down, and they didn't talk to me about it. They didn't even explore it. They didn't even try to go what it is I want to talk about. Um, so they, they, I want democracy. I definitely want consensus-based democracy, and um, I think we need to draw up a power map. We need to draw up a power map. Who rules Louisville? Who's the big players? Who's the big corporate interest? Who's the big wealthy donors? Um, who's the old uh, arist uh, aristocracy? Who's the aristocratic old guard of Louisville? Who controls and runs things here? And don't give me no shit about Republicans or Democrats. I want to know names. I bet there's probably a list of 100 names. Drew Thornton's people or Mayor Fisher's people. He came up rich. So who are these people that are running Louisville? 
They need to do a better job because we can do so much better here. We got so much to offer. The Germans have built a great fucking city. So, viva la revolucion. Uh, Louisville, America, Kentucky, the world, Egypt, Magali, Ana, Ahambuki. <laughs>